All right, good afternoon. So I also have the distinct pleasure of being the vice president in, on, on this board and thankful to serve all of you. I am very happy to have my panelists. First of all, I appreciate you guys all taking the time. Let me just do a quick introduction and just in the interest of time, we'll go right into questions. You guys are here to learn from the best of the best. So first, right here, I have Rehan Alawala. Rehan comes all the way from Karachi, homeland for a lot of us, Karachi, Pakistan. He's the president of Super Technologies. And the thing that intrigues me the most about Rehan, um, and you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more, is just how uh, interesting all the concepts he believes in. And I just love it, Rehan, when you say, I love to make new friends. I think that just says it all. I love to make new friends. I wish that all of us could just say that all day long. So thank you, Rehan, for being here. My next panelist is my good friend, Zain Jeevanji. Zain comes all the way from Silicon Valley. He's been an open charter member for the Silicon Valley for a number of years. He, I don't even know how many companies you run, but currently he runs Insure123, an Escalon services company. And he's also run a whole bunch of travel companies uh, before that. And then my final panelist, locally here from Chicago, our very own Sajid Patel. And Sajid is the CEO of Optimal Design. So thank you, Sajid. I know you've been traveling gracious with your time. Um, all of these three panelists are really entrepreneurs. They have a very interesting story. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of uh, questions with them, and then I'm hoping that those of you that know these three gentlemen will indulge in asking questions and kind of get the flow going. So uh, please do prepare your questions, especially the younger generation here. Um, as I talked about Rehan and Facebook, and I know a lot of people are looking at this Facebook Live, uh, please feel free to ask those questions. So first, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask each one of you if you can just take a couple of minutes to give us one or two pointers about yourselves, uh, about your story. Any one of you can start, and the microphones are right here. It should be. Is that on? Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, uh, I'm Zane. I, I was born in Kenya, East Africa. Uh, grew up in Karachi, uh, the wonderful city, uh, the best city in the world. Uh, came in 83 to the U.S. I'd already done a startup in Pakistan. I started a, a fashion clothing trend in the 70s before there was ready-made clothing for men. In Pakistan, we started that. And uh, uh, one of the designs was a latteki shalwar kameez and a koti, which was designed by Asib Zardari, who was known Asib Baloch that time. He designed it, and we uh, and it became a household name all over Pakistan uh, till 1980. This was 70, 1970, very early. In 83, I migrated to uh, the U.S. I had a child, uh, my third child, who needed medical care, and we migrated to the U.S. He passed away in, in Silicon Valley, and we was we were left with a huge amount of bills. And it just fascinated me that the world's largest economy at that time, which was U.S., did not have a solution for insurance for people to travel into the U.S. So we created the first company in 1985. Uh, it's a household name now all over the world. Uh, Google used it till they became self-insured. Cisco even today uses it for all their people. That company is G&G, it's not my company anymore. I'm the chairman, my son who's somewhere in the audience here runs it, wouldn't let me control it. And, uh, and after that I've done uh, several companies, some in technology space, everything's been insurance related. My latest uh, company, Escon Services, uh, listed in this month's, uh, you know, we timed it so that I'm coming to the open conference. Inc. Uh, Incorporated listed it as the fastest uh, growing company in the US, 500 companies, uh, just this month, so that you could verify it. And um, uh, we do payroll, we do accounting, we do book, we, we actually do everything in the back office for startups. Um, that's, that's so Zen, you do know that after coming to Open Chicago, is going to go from top 500 to top 100. <laughs> we hope so, yeah. All right, Sajid. Thanks, Amr. All right, thanks. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thanks to Open for uh, allowing me to come up here and speak. It's a tremendous organization, and under Harsby's uh, leadership, it's just been you know, accelerating even more. So thanks again for allowing me to be here. Um, my story, you know, I'll um, you know, take it to more of a personal level for myself. Um, you know, I'm probably not unlike a lot of you out there. Um, my parents immigrated to the U.S. Um, I did most of my schooling here. Um, but where my story sort of changes a little bit is that um, throughout uh, my upbringing, um, my father, who's also an engineer, um, you know, had a lot of offers to start up his own business. Um, and he actually seriously considered many of them. Um, however, 
uh, when my sister was born, she was born with um, uh, quite serious medical issues, and this is pre-Obamacare, so um, you know, having a job and having insurance was more critical than anything else. And um, he's recently retired, but you know, he only made seventy-five thousand dollars his entire career working in Indiana, working different engineering jobs, because obviously, you know. Insurance is more important than upward mobility or having a you know a great salary and so on. And you know he sort of left those dreams uh, to the wayside because um, his family was more important, uh, obviously. Um, so you know I, I had seen that sacrifice growing up. Um, he only I think my mom and my dad only saw their parents a total of maybe three times or four times in 40 years. They couldn't even travel, right, with my sister. There's no, there's no way they can go to India and um, see them, and it's very difficult for them to come here. So, seeing all the sacrifices, you know, for me personally, it was this motivation of I have to do something with the sacrifices that they made because that wouldn't do justice to what they gave up for me to have the life that I have. Now, again, we grew up in a middle, in a very middle class household. It wasn't like we were living some life of luxury. That, that not like their life went from a life in India to an amazing life here. You know, so to me, that was a it was a really a core motivation, and, and I think I'd recommend to anyone who's starting a business, you know, have a core motivation. It doesn't have to be you know some life changing event, but have something because you're going to be tested, and you're going to need something to come back to. You're gonna you're gonna have those moments where you go, why am I doing this? Why? What, what is the reason for this? And and these motivations are going to be there for you. So um, you know, so I actually I worked in corporate for a little bit. Um, Motorola Mobility, Palm Computing, and so on, and, um, and then started the business. And um, you know, uh, we we're, we're a self-funded business. Um, we we sort of started from nothing. You know, six thousand dollars and like four computers, <laughs> and uh, and a thousand square foot um, um, place. And now we have over fifty employees, two locations, one year in Chicago, headquarters still in Arlington Heights in the suburbs, but. Um, um, you know, we're, we work with a lot of the top tech companies, Google, uh, Apple. Uh, we're working right now uh, on a virtual reality experience with Disney in partnership with one of our uh, partner companies. That we're going to be launching actually in about a month here with uh, Star Wars as the uh, primary um, uh, property there to start off with. So a lot of great things going on. But, um, but yeah, just, you know, humble beginnings. And i um, really thankful to be here and thankful just to be part of uh, the open event today. Thank you, Sajid. Rehan? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Rehan. Um, it's really challenging to introduce yourself sometimes because if you go too humble, people think, ah, I don't want to listen to this guy. <laughs> if you go too much, oh, I assume he's just too much, right? So you don't really know what kind of crowd you're dealing with. Um, I, I, I live in Pakistan. I still live in Pakistan. Um, I live in Karachi. I started my first business when I was 13. I never went to college, never went to university to study. Um, started over 150 ventures. Started my first company in the US in 1999. And uh, then I was not allowed to come in this country for 11 years. So I had to learn um, how to run a company sitting in Pakistan in the US and end up controlling 5% of the entire phone system in this country. Um, so I had to learn that, and people, my customers used to tell me that I don't exist. Uh, you, you're just a fluke. You're just, uh, you don't, you don't, we have never seen you in our life, so you don't, you can't be real. So I started making videos, and, uh, you know, saying, hi, I'm real, and now I have over maybe 2,000 videos on Facebook and YouTube and everywhere. And um, I was rejected 26 times for different countries for visa based on... Uh, I'm a Pakistani. So I started traveling through social media, and now I have 800,000 people on my Facebook um, all over the world. Is that cut off time? Is that cut off time? Okay. Um, that was Facebook. Okay. So. Um, so now finally I have uh, been, so I grew my company sitting in Pakistan with the amazing team which I have. Uh, actually they do all the work, I just sit there. Um, and I have been able to now, I, we, we got an award, we got invited by Harvard, so I finally got the visa to come here. And, uh, and I met Kiwan at that time also. 
uh, first time. And uh, the eventually I got here. Now I've done 90 countries. I'm trying to go to all the 197 countries. That's what I do. That's why I look like, you know, I totally look opposite to this guy who is the most well-dressed person in this room probably. Uh, I love this man, by the way. He's so humble and always amazes me when I meet him. Um, so I think I'm a student of life right now, uh, trying to understand how it works, uh, because there's so much we don't know. We don't even know how... I did not know how to say Asalaamu Alaikum or hello up till four years ago when I started meeting Fatma Surya Bajia, and I saw that she would go anywhere and just say, hello, beta, how are you? And, you know, she would go like this, and <laughs> everybody will just bow down and get everything done. No bribe required, no money required. Everything just gets done. I was so amazed. How, what magic does this woman have? And this woman's house was like a mosque. Everybody can knock in, bring the bell, and they come in. Hello, beta, how oh, chai pio, you know, have some tea. What's going on here? You know, why, why aren't there security guards outside her house? She's a celebrity. Why doesn't anybody shoot her or kidnap her in Pakistan? So all these questions were stuck in my head, and I started changing myself. And I, I started getting similar magic thing happening to me. Everything just happens automatically. People just show up, and things happen. So I'm just learning how this, this world works. Uh, one of the things which I like to use technology now for is... Pakistan and all the third world countries or the developing countries, whatever the number is, third, one, two, three. Uh, I think the problem is that people who are graduated from good schools, they want to go to Dubai, Europe, US. So we end up with a brain drain. So what I do is, see, because I knew how to live in Pakistan and still work in this country and reverse it. So when I was uh, friends with Facebook and with him, I never met him in his life. I convinced him to be my friend. And not just him, Steve Wozniak and Wall Street Journal editor and owner, they're all my friends now. So I, 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 I go to places. I was in Washington, D.C. last I mean, last month, I think, and a CNN journalist was there, and she said, you're my Facebook friend. I was like, what? Uh, so this is, this is really weird what's happening. But what I want to do, uh, use the power of Facebook to k reverse the brain drain. What I'm doing now is, you know, in Pakistan and many of the countries, unfortunately, we don't have water, electricity, toilet everywhere, but we have Facebook. You just buy a SIM card or free, get it one for free, put it in, and it works. You don't even have to pay anyone to do that. So I started giving free laptops to people like three years ago that if you steal my 500 Facebook friends who are not from Pakistan, I'll give you a free laptop. Now, what does that do? It does. What it does is they have to... They have to look like him, you know, dress up, uh, make, put a nice Facebook photo. Uh, Mariam is here. Mariam, do you have a book of mine? Can, I, can you pass it over? Uh, you have to present yourself and become articulate in yourself and find yourself and find your skill. And then you go out and present and they, fra they friend you. One of the boys who did this experiment is now a partner with Steve Wozniak. And he started a company with him. They have never met each other, ever. They're just Facebook friends. So, so what my goal is now is to have, I mean, the results I'm going to publish, I have 300 stories of these craziness uh, happening, and the, the, these people are doing, changing the world in r ridiculous ways, ridiculous ways. So that's, I don't know if it's too long or big, but thank you so much. That's perfect. Keep the <laughs> All right, so Zen, let's go back to you for a second. Um, I know that you talked about in your introduction about the, the travel insurance business, and I know you're very deep into the health insurance business. And you know that's one topic, and I'm not going to Obamacare, I'm not going to subsidies. We can leave that to the politics. But obviously you're in that field, and there's a lot of people in the audience that are very concerned about where that whole space is going. Would you take a couple of minutes to talk about that? a week to even touch the topic, right? It's very, it's convoluted, it's complex. It, it, it's very complex. Um, um, healthcare in this country, uh, about eight months ago, well, let's start five years ago, I was sitting and I said, we have, we have a, the zillion dollars of, uh, you know, revenue coming in from medical insurance sales uh, to corporate America. And um, we're going to see commissions completely cut off. And we were scared before Obamacare. 
So we started looking at other diversifications and where do you do? What happened really is I think uh, Barack Obama, who's from Kenya like I am, and if you don't believe me, ask Donald Trump, um, <laughs> uh, who, who he did a phenomenal job of fixing a problem that has been existing for years to make an effort for it to change direction and go in a way. I think it was right. He, did, he adjusted our compensation, which used to range at about 8 to 9% of your total bill. Now, many of you startups are now thinking, wow, that means the entire 10% is to go to me. 20% in some cases now drops to about 3 to 4%. On large corporates, we get about a 1%. That's a great adjustment. He fixed up where the profitability, the total expense, a dollar spent on medical care today, 15% can be spent on everything else. The claims are going to be the rest of 85%. Great fix, right? 15% means my salary, people around, admin, claims, everything. So good fixes. So comes in Mr. Trump. And he says, I'm going to take all this out because it's not working. Well, what he did is Obamacare did five major things. Fixed pre-existing. You have a story on pre-existing. I grew my career in the U.S. I like yourself. I'm never, like Rian, I've never worked for anyone. So I don't know what corporate America is. You know, my first startup was in Pakistan when I was 16 years old. So I've never worked for anybody. Don't understand that culture. So nobody paid my premiums. I had to look for it. Pre-existing was a major case. He fixed that. He fixed the major limits that you were covered, covered on. That'll stay. What's scary is that he had to fix the 42 million Americans who couldn't afford to buy or did not want to buy insurance. And the way he fixed it was beautifully. Um, he said, if your income is less than 94, you get a gradual subsidy. That subsidy is what the middle class portion that Trump is trying to take out, which is also right, and I'll tell you why. So what, what Obamacare did is pay you a subsidy if you made less than $94,000. And that subsidy could go, so if you made $28,000, your medical care was completely free anywhere in the country, it is today, on top of it, the plan that you get has lower deductibles and lower co-insurance. Why? Because if you're poor, you can't pay the $1,000. Smart thing to do. What they did not account for is what Walgreens did, what Walmart did. So Walgreens, the average salary is $28,000. So Walgreens was spending $430 a month for each employee. I think they have, what, 15,000 employees or 20,000? And what they did is, there's a penalty they have to pay if you don't give medical care. So they will pay the penalty, which is $2,000 a year per employee. So multiply that by 15000 instead of $470 a month times uh, 15000 Obamacare did not know that corporate America will connive against this and take advantage of it. And that's what it is. A lot of blame goes to the insurance companies. Sure, you know, the big boardrooms that I used to go in the 80s, a link, um, Penn Mutual's boardroom was almost as big as this conference room, right? Those have all slimmed down a little bit. I spend less money on my bow ties than I did before. We have to trim down a little bit. But I think where it needs to be is pharmaceuticals, and I think the session before touched on it. But there are lots of things in there that are also that are naive to the common man. But anyway, this could be a very long answer. Absolutely. I don't want to touch it. Thank you. And Sajid, coming down to you, um, I know you're in the IoT side of the house. I know your company has won a lot of awards. I know our audience has got the magazine so they can read about it. But I did uh, talk to you earlier about an experience you had with your product being on Shark Tank. Most of you know that Shark Tank is very prestigious. Could you speak about that? Yeah, you know, uh, we actually, uh, being a digital consultancy, we have the opportunity to work with a lot of different startups and we get to see, um, you know, all facets of the startup game. And, and obviously we're, you know, part of that as well. So um, we had uh, one of our uh, customers come to us uh, a while back and, you know, had an idea, but really had no idea how to execute it. And that's really where we come in, right? We come in, people have ideas and they say, oh, well, how do I get this product or service out there? And so our job is to figure out how to do that. Um, we're a vertically integrated uh, company, so we do everything from the initial design all the way through to ergonomics to electrical, mechanical, uh, software engineering, and so on. So we're able to go basically soup to nuts, and even we even manufacture a lot of the equipment ourselves. So um, one of our um, uh, so one of our clients came up and said that they had this really good idea, and um, we um, you know worked through the entire process with them, and uh, they submitted to Shark Tank. 
first time and um, you know they didn't actually think they were going to get in but we thought you know we had sufficiently uh, given them a solution that was going to uh, be a real winner and it was the first time on Shark Tank when that product um, made it to market that they actually bid it higher than what he was asking for. So I think he was asking for about a 15%, a, a uh, 10 to 15% uh, equity stake for I think like $150,000, but they actually gave him a 30% stake because two of the uh, sharks um, got into a battle about it, which is good, and uh, they gave him uh, quite a bit more. And they told him that was the first time that they've seen someone get you know that much um, extra out of their Shark Tank appearance. And and so you know, but in general, uh, just having the 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 ability to look at the entire startup landscape and see how people are raising funds, what the trend is in the industry, uh, from going from convertible notes to people you know going to private equity uh, for for fundraising to VCs. Um, we're intimately involved in a lot of those kinds of conversations with them. So it's really kind of a fascinating place to be where we're sort of a business who's went through the launch phase ourselves, though we're self-funded, um, you know, just going through the process of watching other businesses do the same thing and being kind of an advisory council for them is kind of a really interesting point to be in. That's great, and congratulations on that. Thank you. Let's give him a round of applause. All right, so let's go back to Rehan. So Rehan, I'm reading your card. I, I just love what you write in here. Rehan says, I love to make new friends. I use social media to connect people from all over the world in order for us to learn, understand, and love each other more. How cool is that? I'm on a quest to connect one million people via Facebook. Will you join me? Can you talk about that? What's, what's your dream? Um. Well, as I said, the uh, the world is becoming flatter and flatter and flatter, right? We talk now to all over the globe through WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, Skype for free. When I started my business here uh, in telecom, 2000, it was $5 a minute to call Pakistan. I offered a dollar, then I made it five cents, and I made a killing. The, the world is changing. The world we live in is very, very, very different, but we don't understand it. And that's the big problem. That's why we blame everybody else for all our problems. And that's an easy way out. Um, so I started a foundation, and the and one of the projects under that is called the Institute of Peace. The website is instituteofpeace.org. And we encourage so-called enemies to talk to each other. And the way we do is is many different ways, um, but primarily on Facebook. So now I have thousands of Jews, thousands of uh, Christians, thousands of uh, all races and all country people on my Facebook, and I throw different questions on my wall, and you can imagine what kind of haywalk it created, creates, because all of a sudden you have all points of views bouncing in the same thing. No, you are coffee, no, you're wrong, no, you're wrong. Well, bring some proof. So what happens is that it allows finally an, um, a kind of conversation which starts with hate, really big haters. But 200 comments later, they become friends. They're like, oh, okay, well, let's meet up. <laughs> so that's, I, saw, I saw that uh, like a few years ago, and then I, I do this full time now. I spend most of my day in trying to expose people do things which they don't understand, and they don't because of those understanding, we remain in a certain way. Pakistan is not a poor country. Pakistan is one of the most powerful countries on the planet, with 200 million people who can make the G the per capita like Singapore at seventy-five thousand dollars a a person. Pakistanis have 24 hours, Singaporeans have 24 hours. Pakistanis have the same internet, pa Singaporeans have the same internet. Pakistanis have edX, Singaporeans have edX. Now, how come a person who never went to school in his life from Pakistan, not me, there's another guy, um, is teaching to Singaporeans to teach, make $100,000 a year? How can that be possible? It is possible in today's day and age with the YouTubing, with everything. This boy who used to sell biryani found a computer, a something called computer, computer he called it, and then that computer guy is now teaching the planet. He's like called onlineustad.com, you can check it out, and he's making $100,000 sitting in Pakistan tax-free. 
Why? How is that possible? The w it is possible because the whole game is changing. Trump can promise jobs, but what happens to all the 10 million truck drivers who will be out of job in 10 years because the trucks will drive themselves? And the taxi guys. So the world is, has to reinvent itself, and we are, we are sort of focused on traditional education. We're, we're focused on the pre-YouTube, pre-Facebook, pre-LinkedIn time zone. You know, like we have to have a Harvard degree, otherwise we are a failure of some kind. Um, so I don't send my children to school. I have six kids. One, two of them are here. Uh, they don't go to school, regular school. They don't. I don't send them. I, I was like, why? Why do you want to go and get destroyed your brain, right? Go and go and travel the world. Go and see real people. Go and see real mentors who can teach you. Like this is how it used to be 200 years ago. Why can't it be done again? And while you're teaching, while you're learning, how about teaching it to a, a hundred thousand other people? So whatever I learn is being broadcasted on my Facebook. You can join me and join my classroom. And that's how I learn. I go out to the world so I can travel and others who cannot can see through my eyes. If they want to, I can ask their questions to them. So that's the kind of weird answer there is. I mean, I don't know. There's no real no, answer. No, that's great. It's very, it's very different. It's not what... A lot of people would expect, but yeah. that's what makes that's who what you are. That's what crazies are, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. All right, so let's go to the audience. Where are my, where are my college students? I'll come back to you in a second. Question? Somebody raise their hands. Come on. Somebody's got to have a Facebook question from one of my college kids. Don't be shy. Otherwise, I'm going to pick on you. So is anybody here looking for money for startups? Here? Can't tell. Alia? One guy? That's it? Nobody else wants money? Hello. Right. That's, I thought that's what mother was saying. Hey, go beta, go make some money, <laughs> right? right. Uh, like, yes. So this question comes out of the, the slew of not asking questions. But from, from, from all three of your standpoints, you, you, your network has been basically your net worth. Could you talk about how sort of um, you, know, you took initiative and, and made sure to keep moving forward, even though there were probably times where you were down and, and saying, oh, I'm not going to go out and meet these people. I, I'd rather sit at home and do nothing. Uh, repeat, I'll repeat the question and try to answer it too. The question is, um, every time you're falling down, how do you get up, right? So a rope a dope of the Muhammad Ali trick, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I've had several challenges in my life and, and, they, and everyone in this room has had their own challenges in a different fashion. I truly believe that the challenges you get of the magnitude that you can solve. Does anybody here, has anybody got the problems uh, on their desk today? A note from Trump saying, please solve the, uh, the Cordia problem. Has anybody got that email? No. You did? No, no. Did you get it? No. No, you didn't because you can't solve it. You, you'll only get that problem when you can solve it. If you truly believe that in your mind that every problem you get is solvable, if it isn't, you'll get to a stage, and then you'll solve a part of it, and another solution will show up, and you'll eventually solve it. So I think that's what it is. Uh, everybody gets challenges. The magnitude looks big to you, but everybody gets that. Question here for Rehan. Can I answer that one? Sure. So uh, the way I see it is like a Bollywood movie. You, you are a hero. You get shot. You just don't fall down. You just keep on going for three hours. You sing a song on the way. And you keep on going on it. You know, the movie has to end. You just don't die. You just, you just don't die. Like the Terminator guy. He just doesn't give up, right? So you just keep on going, no matter what happens. Even if you lose a leg or lose a hand or whatever, you just keep on going. No matter what, it's a girl you're after or the career or the job or the, or the startup, whatever it is. It's the persistence. And that's what I think Trump got elected. That's what got him elected. He just never gave up. He said, if I, if I lose, next day I'm going to court to sue her. Right? He just, he, his perseverance was what won him the election. I think that's the only thing he had. And if you get that in anything, you will get it. You will, you will get that done. Uh, how's it going, Rehan? I'm Zane. Um, had a question on your Facebook uh, strategy. Um, so you go, you're advocating just going out and adding people. Out. I mean, doesn't, isn't that a little creepy? Like, to what? <laughs> I, I'm just curious how that's working out for you. And yeah. <laughs> So imagine you study now at Stanford or Harvard. You're hanging out in your classroom. 
Well, don't you want to go out and meet those people? Don't you want to communicate with them? Those are the people who are going to become your future startup partners, your future spouses maybe, your future, your, your future is with them. You d business is not done based on intellect only. It's done most based on trust. If I don't trust this guy, I'm not going to do business with him. The trust starts with, hello, how are you? And it's not creepy. It's hi, it's, it's hi how are you? you? Just start there. And that's, it's a book. It's, it shows you how to you know, like make Facebook friends. But you know, how, to make it f uh, how to make friends and influence people was such an amazing book. But what I have done is I've collected 5,000 of the most amazing people on the planet. You can come and take my friends and ask them to become your friends. Because these people, as I said, they're Wozniaks of the world. These are crazy people who are willing to change the world. So I'm offering you that network to come in. People hide their network. Everybody hides and wants to oh, know, this is my net worth. I'm not going to share it. I'm saying, here you go. Take them, learn from them, grow with them, watch them every single day. Because learning is not like one time. You can't just get a degree. It's like every single day, small pieces of information that allows you to become what you're supposed to be. You can't, you, we, I, I wish I could eat for a whole week. I cannot. I have to eat every day. It's, it's a lot of work. So, but it is how it is. Learning goes on all your life. And I'm suggesting have great friends. There's a, there's, when we were like in sixth grade, uh, it's better to be alone than a ba have a bad friend and it's better to have a good friend than being alone so that's kind of if you have a good network your net worth will be if I have my five best friends as millionaire you're the sixth guy dude it's the, he's going to pull you up because he doesn't want to he's in his Tesla you, you're in your you're in your, you're in your whatever, right? So he's going to pull you up. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to add something to that. Last year in Chicago, when I was here, I was, I was, I was on a, speaking on a panel, um, speaking, and when I went out, you know, a whole bunch of uh, guys exchanged cards with me. I was at Lum speaking on a class, and I did the same thing. I made a statement. I said, please add me to your LinkedIn as a friend. And, and I said, I'll add you, and I, I make the condition to everybody that goes on my LinkedIn, I've got about 11,000 friends on LinkedIn, and these are not, and I'm not a blonde. So, you know, uh, it's, you don't get friends to me unless you really need something of me. And, and, and these guys did. In Chicago, what happened is, um, I sent this friend a request because he gave me his card, he said, become friend. I sent him my request, and Andy Grove of Intel, that very moment I'd got a request from him on LinkedIn, saying, Zane, I want to be your friend. And so I accepted Andy. Then I got a response back from this guy on a message saying, can you please explain to me why do you want to be my friend? So to get the reserves out, mellow down a bit. I think we have too many no's in our mental blockage that Pakistanis do. Pakistanis do this more often than others. And I say, hey, I'm a pure Pakistani, by the way. Uh, so I'm telling you this, we've got to be good. You know, when you sent me the friend request, it was six years, seven years ago, I don't know when, eight years ago. And what did I do? And you were coming to San Francisco, I said, come and stay with me. I'd never met him. Never seen his face. My wife was sitting here and said, invite Pakistan Taliban Was it true? And you know, he's, he and I, we exchanged so many, so much knowledge is exchanged. Uh, there's two books I'll suggest. Go Giver is one. Go give her, read the book. It's a good short read. How to give more. If at the end of the day you've given more than received, you're a winner. Just give more than received. Sorry. That's okay. There's a question for Sajid. Um, hi, my name is Hassan. I'm a college student. And my question is from uh, Mr. Patel. Actually, it's from, for all three of you. Now, what was the one, thi one thing you regret not knowing in your life uh, before uh, related to your professional field? Thank you. That's a big question. A lot of things I regret. <laughs> um, you know, I think from a uh, from a business standpoint, um, I really didn't have the understanding of what the difference is between a vision and strategy. And you know, where you think, well, I just want this great business, and I and I, and I know what, it, what I want it to be, and you think you can just sheer by will have it get there. If you don't have a solid strategy on how you're going to do that, and the the um, 
you know, the ups and downs you're going to go through through that process. I mean, it goes through with the other question that was that was said about when you fall down, what do you do? You know, how do you get back up again, right? So, you know, when we first started the business, it was it was a small, you know, kind of an engineering business only, and it really just kind of focused on on one one aspect of it. But we knew we wanted to get to, uh, to be a lot bigger. But it's when you're self-funded specifically, it's hard to have a strategy that's going to make sense for long term when you've got to pay the bills in the short term, right? So that's that, that makes it a very difficult climb up. And um, I kept thinking, well, you know, I does this vision, I know what I want it to be, but that's kind of where I stopped. And until I got to a point where I realized, well, you know, I need to have a strategy now. I need to actually make this uh, execute in a scalable manner in a way that's going to make sense for the business itself. And it's not just going to organically, just because I have a business doesn't mean it's going to become successful. Just because I have a, a, uh, an idea doesn't mean it's going to flourish and become this great idea. You know, I didn't actually understand that. As, as silly as that may sound, it sounds really silly to me right now, but I, I know that that wasn't really part of it up until about three or four years into it, and I realized, well, this isn't working. This isn't how I'm going to be able to make this happen. So. To me, that's what I regret, is that someone sat me down and said, okay, you have this vision, it's a great vision, now let's put, sit down and put together a strategy. I think it goes a lot with what I think Brother Amir was saying earlier about having, you know, talking about exit strategy and having all of these things written down and making sure that you, you know, either yourself or you have a sounding board that, that's going to hold you accountable to it and make you go through that process. You know, on a on a daily, weekly, monthly, you know, annual basis, it's really important. So I think to me, that's really the, the one regret that I have. Uh, I know we're running out of time. Three regrets. I wish I could dress as good as uh, Anserior. Uh, <laughs> have a network like round. Third regret, which is the actual regret, is my wife and my son are in the audience. I wish I could spend more time with my family. So when you become an entrepreneurship entrepreneur, remember that there is a sacrifice. Everybody talks about time management. It's you. you there is a sacrifice. I wish I could spend more time with my family. That's my regret. All right, I know, I'm sorry, you had a quick question. Go ahead. Very quick and a comment, sorry. You know, I, I really liked what you said, even though I don't understand how you got 8,000 people on the Facebook, and don't make sense, but anyway. But, but oh, sorry, uh, but, but here is a question. You know, so, you know, we change, we hire a lot of young talent. That's why I wanted to make a point. And we really spent a lot of money, which I had to approve, because we have this new open concept, because these guys just want to work in a team environment. So you have to understand your consumer. You have to understand who you're hiring now. I'm outdated. We talked about it last year. They think differently. Amazon is ordering everything online. That's just how the life is going to be going forward. So your, your point is very valid. But I have a very quick question for, uh, for, for Zane about the healthcare. Uh, you know, you talk about that, you know, people, you, you, you know, it's Obamacare or it's Trump did this and, you know, uh, and I'm going to put you on the spot because you, had, you asked me very hard questions at the panel in uh, San Francisco. <laughs> but how does that work that we have thousands of employees and they don't take uh, insurance because we try to create a purposeful environment for them, but they don't understand it. So everything we create, they just don't take the insurance and we have to end up paying for it because there's a penalty. So when you're saying that, okay, you know, the health care is not, you know, the companies just pay for it, we're willing to give them the insurance. They just don't take it because yeah. they don't understand the concept. Well, because the, the, the majority of people, the portion that they have to pay for their dependents, when you're paying just for the employee, the portion they have to pay for the dependents is far greater, and they can't qualify for that if you're offering benefits. If you don't offer benefits, they go to Obamacare and get it for free, completely free. So they'd rather not take it and get the whole thing free than pay part of the, that's part of, but you have to analyze it, you know, forensically a little more to see why really they're not participating. We could side chat on that. Great, so um, what an awesome panel. Let's give all three of them a round of applause. Thank you, gentlemen.